Hey everyone, it's April 14th, 2019, and it's your episode 178 of At Percussion. With me, as usual, are my co host Carly Vigna. Hi, everyone. And Ben Charles is here. Hi, everybody. Ben, do you realize what tonight is? Do you know what this means? Uh, I'm guessing something about Game of Thrones. Yeah, good job. That's right. That's right. I didn't know, but I just know you. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Finally, someone on the show cares. That sounds like you care, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Who is who is sitting there with you? You have someone with you today. So I have our uh, guest from episode, I don't remember, 48 or something like that. Anders Estrand is here with me. We're playing a concert tomorrow. Anders, it's good to see you. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Great to see you all. And uh, thanks to Ben inviting me. Yeah, sure. What are, you, what are you doing with Ben tomorrow? We play one piece with your percussion group. And then yeah. I play with some jazz combos and so on. So I'm, I'm kind of running around all over. Do my thing. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, it's way cool to have you. And, and also, also, sorry, yeah. Anders left out one thing he's doing. My my percussion methods class is playing "Beat It" by Michael Jackson, and I got Anders to come do the Eddie Van Halen guitar solo on it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're going to do this on guitar. How could you forget? How could you forget? Oh, sorry. I'm like, kind of nervous, right? <laughs> on vibes or on guitar? Both. Well, <laughs> tomorrow the guitar comes out. <laughs> well, cool. It's good to see you. If Ben's going to cook food for you tonight, you're in for a treat. That's happening. That's happening. Good, good. Well, y'all, today's guest is a buddy of ours, and he specializes in theatrical voice and percussion music. He's a trained percussionist, but also a classically trained baritone, and you can really hear this in his really beautiful 2015 CD release titled Theatrical Music for Solo Percussion. He's currently serving as the principal percussionist for the 20th Century Consort. This is a resonant new music ensemble at the Smithsonian American Art Gallery and he's been doing that since 2012. He's played all over, including Carnegie Hall, and we see him play at, I guess, PASIC last year. He's a unique performer, and he teaches at the University of Maryland, and it's our buddy Lee Hinkle. How's it going, Lee? Hey, guys. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining me on. us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. What's What's happening lately? Oh, man. Well, it's the middle of the school year so things are busy on campus as always for all of us who are college teachers and um, last night I had the final concert of the season with uh, what is now called the 21st century consort we updated our name with the time Um, so we had a concert last night and I had the privilege of playing a a world premiere piece by Susan Bati Um, really unusual uh, ensemble it was a uh, mix of the Folger Consort, which is uh, the period ensemble. Um, so they do a bunch of stuff with like viola da gambas and recorders and all of this medieval type music. Um, both of the 21st Century Consort and the Folger Consort are music directed by Christopher Kendall, um, who's the former dean at the University of Michigan, also a former director from the University of Maryland. He still comes into town uh, to work with those two ensembles. And so we sort of teamed up last night on the 21st Century Consort concert and premiered this new piece by Susan Bati um, for three female vocalists, um, a guy who played bass recorder, tenor recorder, I think, Irish flute, and also bagpipes, uh, another player who played electric viola da gamba and also a traditional viola da gamba, and then another person who played viola da gamba, and then I had a bunch of toys and cool sounds. I got to play a balafone for the first time, which I had never done before, and uh, some frame drums and a uh, daff, which I'd never even actually seen a real daff in person before, the jingly frame drum thing. Yeah, um, right. So it was super cool. I got to learn some new instruments, and uh, the performance re- went really well. They also played um, Black Angels by George Crumb uh, with a string quartet from National Symphony. and So it was a really cool concert. That was last night. Wow, cool. The, the website is 21stCenturyConsort.org. And I was poking through just the recording archive. It's huge. There's a ton of good sounding recordings there. Are you guys are you recording with them frequently? So um, we've had a number of different recording projects. We have a grant. Um, I think it might be an NEA grant um, to record all of our concerts and archive them through our website. Um, so essentially, anything we've ever played 
you can go onto the website that you mentioned and you can listen to those recordings. It's an incredible resource for uh, contemporary music. We've premiered hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces, um, you know, to name just a few. I mean, the ensemble has been around since about 1978, I think. And um, we premiered Schwantner Sparrows with Lucy Shelton, who was the, the, the soprano that it was actually written for. And she was actually on the Susan Bati piece last night, which was super cool because she's an amazing performer. Um, yeah, it's, it is an incredible resource for contemporary music, for sure. Well, Lee, you mentioned uh, George Crumb. I just wanted to mention, I'm trying to find it really quickly, that uh, Ian Rosenbaum posted on Facebook the other day that he and Iano and a few other people uh, let's see here. It's Chamber Music Society is premiering a new percussion quintet by George Crumb called Kronos Cryptos. So check out Ian's Facebook for him talking about that piece. Yeah, I saw the photo he put up. The gear was just incredible. I mean, they had an entire what looked like storage unit full of equipment for the piece. I'm sure, <laughs> sure being Crumb, it's very easy <laughs> <laughs> with very large note heads. <laughs> in, in in Houston once we did this mix of you know Crumb has those song cycles those sets the madrigal sets I think and there's a, a you know each set has a different setup and the setup by itself of one set is fine but when you do one movement from this set two movements from that set another movement from this other set it was just hell on earth setup wise everyone had to have. Yeah, it was yeah ridiculous. Bad idea. Carly, I think you were going to ask Lee something about Stuart Saunders Smith, maybe? Yeah, well, you know, first I have um, a little background information on Stuart Saunders Smith to talk with you about because Lee is so well known for his work in theatrical percussion um, and also for his collaborations with the composer Stuart Saunders Smith, um, who may be familiar to many of you, but... Um, I have a little a little biographical information and some information about his pieces. So Stuart Sunder Smith was born in Portland, Maine um, in 1948. He began both percussion and compositional studies um, at the age of six and later went on to study uh, at the Berklee College of Music at the Hart School and at University of Illinois. Um, many, many, many of Stuart's pieces um, are written for percussion, partially because he is a percussionist. Um, and some of his major pieces for percussion include um, the Link series for vibraphone, uh, Tunnels, and Points North, Songs 1 through 9, um, the authors, and like I said, many more. You can go on his website and see a, a very long list of all of his compositions. Um, when I think about characteristics of Stuart's music, um, one of the things that comes to mind is really complex rhythmic figures like polyrhythms. Um, and Stuart's talked about this and he talks about how he's, he's kind of trying to capture like the, the natural and organic rhythms that occur in the world, um, which I think is really interesting. But that's one, one of the threads that connect a lot of Stuart's pieces. Um, let's see, other things are, are like his, his connection of rhythm with pitch and different characters in the theatrical pieces. Um, personally, what I remember after my first exposure to Stewart's music, uh, which happens to have been some of Lee's graduate recitals at the University of Maryland, um, I couldn't really explain why, but everything about the piece just seemed right and it seemed how it should be. Um, and it didn't necessarily make sense logically, but it just seemed like a like such a complete artistic statement. Um, Many of Stewart's pieces involve the use of text, um, as many theatrical pieces do. And one piece that I've performed many times um, and that I also wrote about in my dissertation is Songs 1 through 9 for actor percussionists. Um, and in this piece, the text includes both made up words, like kind of combinations of consonants and vowels and syllables, um, as well as English words, but they're taken often out of context from their regular meaning. Um, which I, I think is just really interesting and reminds me of an interview I heard a while ago with uh, former U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky. Um, and he's talking about how he used to, when he was younger, he would read like complicated texts or, or dictionaries and just find, just find words that he didn't know the meaning of, but he just really enjoyed the, the juxtapositions of the, the sounds, all the vowels and consonants and the different ways they could be arranged. Um, and finally, one, one more quote that I found doing some research um, is from one of the major texts on Stuart's 
on Stuart Sanders Smith by John Welsh. It's called The Music of Stuart Sanders Smith. And Welsh says, Smith does not claim to be a poet but rather one who composes music with the sound of words, um, which I think really kind of nicely ties up, ties up this, this element of completeness that, that we hear in his music. So um, I'm really excited to hear from Lee about some of his work um, collaborating with Stuart Smith. So Lee, could you tell us what that collaboration was like? I have been so incredibly lucky to have had Stuart essentially as my next door neighbor for many, many years. Um, he used to serve on the faculty at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is just about a 30 minute drive from us here at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, and during his tenure, when he was a professor there, before he retired, I got to collaborate in with, uh, with him on tons of recording projects. Um, he was a member of my dissertation committee um, when I decided to do my dissertation on theatrical music for solo percussion. Uh, and we've worked together on countless projects. Um, probably the most special to me is The Authors. Um, the piece was actually um, commissioned by Jamie Dietz, um, who was a percussionist who unfortunately passed away uh, just recently, um, far before his time. He's a very young, very, very talented uh, percussionist who um, commissioned Stuart for this piece. It's an 11 movement work um, for a single performer who plays marimba and sings and speaks and acts all the while they play the marimba. And I had the pleasure of playing it at a recent PASIC. Um, that piece to me is just one of the most beautiful, I think the way you said it, Carly, was awesome. It's just one of these amazing artistic statements, I mean, for any instrument. Uh, and I just feel so lucky that he wrote it for the marimba and I had the pleasure of premiering it and I think probably at this point, I have over 50 performances of the piece. And each time I perform the piece, I'm always struck by how amazing it is and how positive the audience reaction is to it. Even though it has quite a bit of crunchy moments and it's a, a very contemporary solo piece, I think um, the text really ties it together for people. I feel like they have something to latch on to because of the words and to my mind, um, the piece tells a story of a single person's life. It could be any person. And it's just snapshots from that person's life, sort of in cinematic form. So, you know, it doesn't go in chronological order. For instance, there's one movement shoot um, where it's excerpts from the author shoot. And uh, the text is a little kid's poem. And so he instructs you to build a homemade marimba um, and you actually sing the pitches of the notes that you create for your homemade marimba, and you also speak uh, this child poem. And so putting that movement together was just so much fun because I got to pretend to be a little kid. And I mean, what's more fun than that? Um, and it was also, there was a, a lot of challenges in finding pitches for the little homemade marimba that I make that I could actually sing, uh, which was a tricky part too. But um, that collaboration in particular has been very special. Um, I think, you know, the, the newest thing, uh, collaboration that we have going on right now, I actually just spoke with Stuart, um, right before this, uh, interview, um, because he's writing me a new evening length piece for, um, theatrical percussionist and vibraphone. Um, so I'm really excited about that. It's going to include a lot of singing and speaking just like the authors did, but, um, I can't wait to see it. I'm hoping to premiere it next season, possibly in the fall or next spring. Um, but we're working on having it copied at this time. So those are the latest. Things. And you said an evening length? Yeah, I think he's planning for about an hour long piece. Oh, my life's just off. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. And it's always, does, is Stuart's music always the soloist is the one speaking? Is there ever, I feel like so many other composers, they just do narration separately or voice separately and two people, you know, two or more people. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and in fact, in the authors, the 11th movement ends with um, a narrator who is specified by Stuart to be of the opposite sex of the performer. And they're supposed to start speaking randomly from the audience sort of as a surprise. Um, so for instance, what I did at PASIC, um, Sylvia Smith was the narrator for that section of the piece. And 
Uh, it's supposed to be a surprise, but also the text for the the eleventh movement um, is about a relationship and love and all of those things. So I think he wanted to sort of have that aspect to it, like that partnership with the person who said. And it's it's very shocking too because you've been hearing twenty six minutes of music, and then suddenly in like the twenty seventh minute of the piece. Um, this voice comes out of nowhere and it's a big surprise and it's a very cool effect. Um, but I think um, there is a lot of difficulty that comes with trying to speak while you're playing. Uh, it takes an awful lot of practice and I, I'd be happy to talk about that process of how I approach it, um, if that's something that's interesting to you guys. But I think you're right, Casey, that a lot of times it is two separate performers because it's hard to get a text across and really portray the meaning and get all the nuances and everything if you're also trying to play at the same time. There's just a lot going on. Well, and there's something really cool when I hear people who aren't, you know, you're a classically trained baritone. I mean, you, you're able to perform this just totally differently than your average percussionist. You know, the, the, the piece I do by Diana McIntosh called All Too Consuming, you do have to speak and play and and you you're supposed to sing and man the singing part i just i'm terrible <laughs> like i can like i can kind of do it but our, i remember my recital the sound guy was like um yeah you just need to sing like three times as loud <laughs> <laughs> i'm technically singing but i'm like i'm messing i mean i'm making his job more difficult because i i can't really sing like the composer can diana mcintosh is a trained singer so it's just, it's, it's, but it's really cool. You know, like I really love, I've listened to every preview on your CD that I can find, but the, uh, it's so different than when I see, you know, just another percussionist do, yeah, do something with voice, you know, Ben, I think you were going to say something. Yeah. All this brings to mind a piece that I recently performed and I, I think I probably mentioned it a couple episodes ago called A Robe of Orange Flame by Christopher Dean. Uh, and it's a 30 minute solo for thunder sheet and spoken voice. Um, and so has many of the issues of speaking and talking that we're playing about that uh, Lee has spoken to, no pun intended. But um, I also wanted to ask Lee, you mentioned like an evening length piece and this piece is 30 minutes long. So it's basically half of a recital. Uh, and another piece that comes to mind is like the Bartok Sonata. It's 30 minutes long. And so it creates programming challenges because like, uh, a robe of orange flame, like nothing can really follow it. It has to be last on a recital. And you also can't put like a minute of news on the same recital as a robe of orange flame. It just feels a little too, you know, sort of <laughs> cheesy to put something like that on a on such a serious piece. And the Bartok, I think also, it needs something that can stand up to that. So Lee, as far as programming challenges, obviously if it's an evening length piece, you don't have to program anything else, but uh, something 30 minutes long as far as programming challenges, do you have any thoughts or opinions on that? Yeah, it certainly is a consideration. And the authors in particular is such a taxing piece, um, physically and like emotionally, it's just an epic piece to perform. I get done with the thing and I'm like soaked in sweat and I'm vocally tired and you know, I'm just like mentally exhausted. So yeah, finding something to pair with that is super, can be super difficult. Um, so what is the solution? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, sometimes I'll program something, some things to completely contrast. I like to do um, performances like that where I'll have something maybe very drummy and then a very introspective type thing like the authors and then something maybe tuneful to sort of give the audience's ears a break um, and help them like work through the recital uh, and keep it interesting that way. I've also at times just wanted to do an all theatrical concert. And so I've spent, you know, um, a lot of time thinking about that programming. I did do my dissertation on theatrical music for solo percussion. So I did for our dissertation, for the dissertation that I was responsible for, it was a series of three hour long recitals of music of that type. Um, so I was doing everything from Stuart Saunders Smith to like the Jennifer Stas Stasic Six Elegies Dancing, um, which is a wonderful piece as an introduction uh, to the genre. It's for solo marimba that has composed movements written into the score. So it doesn't have any speaking or singing, but it has a, like certain ways that you're supposed to move when you play the marimba. It's, it's like a, a nice uh, teaser to get into the genre. Uh, and the marimba part is not, it's super difficult. Well, certainly not compared to a lot of the rep that's out there now, things like Casey Wright um, or Bias or you know, those guys. Um, 
but uh, it's a great introduction. Uh, and so I was doing things like Global Car. Um, I was doing Stuart Saunders Smith. And I was also doing a lot of commissioning as part of the dissertation, too. Um, so I managed to get some nice new pieces for the repertoire as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I was talking to actually Christopher Dean uh, about a week ago. I saw him play, of all things, the Bartok Sonata. And on this concert, they did the Bartok Sonata as well as two piano, two percussion version of Rite of Spring. So the, the pianist played the Rite of Spring, you know, two piano version, and then the percussionist basically picked and chose out of, you know, as much of the percussion part as they could. So that was pretty cool to hear. And Carly and I heard Svet do the Bartok paired with uh, symphonic dances from West Side Story. So it was the same mm -hmm. thing. There's a two piano version they added percussion to. And uh, I talked to Mr. Dean and I said it'd be cool to do the Bartok as a first half of the concert, then a robe of orange flame as a second half, which I think from such a large ensemble to such a small piece would be a pretty cool contrast. But cool. Interesting thoughts for sure. Did you tell him it'd be pretty cool for him to come on the podcast sometime? Uh, I don't <laughs> think I got to that. That would have been a good. Even if you're listening. That would have been a good, a good chance to do that. <laughs> Anders, I want to hear your voice. What are you thinking? I, yeah, so Lee, I'm thinking about, it's kind of interesting to hear because I also think from many, many thoughts about this, but it's like uh, one point is what I see with um, old using voice and so on, what's very popular in Europe is like uh, Maurice Coggan. I don't know if you've been in contact with his music or not, but it's like, that's a little, I would say, different approach, right? Because sometimes you feel it's like about more comedian part of it as well. Mm -hmm. It's not so much voice, including that, from what I remember, but it's more like a theatrical point of view. Have you been in that game with his music? Or? I um, say that the composer's name again. I missed it. Morris Coggle. No, I'm not familiar. Mm -hmm. Coggle. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I'm familiar. Sorry, I did I'm not work. <laughs> 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 I. I did not work on his music as part of my project that I did. I know that Carly has done a lot of Carly work on Pog, uh, but um, I, I am very familiar with the European uh, canon of this music. Um, my wife actually has a, a university teaching position in France, so I go back and forth a lot um, for things over there. And um, one of the things that was really fascinating for me when I was doing my project was the discovery that Stuart and a few others in the United States, Stuart Smith, and the there was a school of composers in Europe, Apergy, Global Car, um, among others, um, that were doing a lot of this theatrical percussion stuff essentially for the first time in the 1970s. And they had no idea that they were doing this. They, they were completely separately pursuing these goals. didn't check it out like goals. on YouTube or anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess not. Uh, and that realization was very cool for me, and I, I, I still am not sure why exactly that happened. I think some of it had to do with the time period, the number of people who were really capable players. Um, but it, it was just happening at the same time in Europe and America. And I don't, and according to Stuart, he had no idea that the European composers were doing this at the same time. Um, so that was an interesting thing I discovered. Yeah, we had we had in Sweden, we had, in Stockholm, we had a Monday group. There was a lot of composers who tried to get into new ideas, like new paths. So a lot of voice stuff came up, of course, and the theatrical, and you play on the top of the church and, and uh, every Sunday, and you do like, you know, brass quintets, but you do it totally in, in another way, and a lot of happenings. Just to, yeah. It's the kind of same style, like uh, Cage start to kind of reach out and see what can you do different and all this stuff, so. Yeah. So, what, so my question to you is like also, what took you into this? Mm. Yeah, um, well, I've been so lucky to have a series of really amazing teachers um, who have encouraged me and my creativity. Um, when I first started in music uh, as a kid, I started on violin, piano, and voice. Um, and I did that for most of my young life. And then when I got to middle school, I started playing some percussion and sort of dropped the violin and the piano as I became more involved with percussion. But I've always kept singing as well. And when I auditioned for undergraduate school, I auditioned on voice and percussion. It was accepted on both. Um, and I studied both very seriously and I had lead operatic roles and things like that. And I still sing professionally to this day, uh, separately from my percussion career, sometimes together. So when I was wow. starting to do my dissertation, I, 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 it just made perfect sense because I discovered this repertoire um, 
through people like Jamie Dietz, who commissioned the authors, um, and some others. And I started thinking, well, these things go hand in hand. I also have kind of had a pipe dream for a really long time. Um, you all are familiar with the famous glockenspiel excerpt from the magic flute. Yes. So that role is a baritone singer and the character's name is Papageno. Right. And at the moment in the opera, he plays his magical glockenspiel, which is the glockenspiel excerpt that we all practice. But he never um, plays it. But he never actually plays it, right? On yeah. stage, so I always thought, well, maybe I could be the guy who finally actually plays the glockenspiel lick on stage as the character Papageno. And then I was like, oh, do I really want to do that? <laughs> You've had lead <laughs> opera roles? I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, in undergraduate school, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I got to be Figaro in The Marriage of Figaro and uh, Stefano in a Donizetti opera. And I got to do a Ravel opera, um, L'Enfant Le Potelege, which is, uh, I was the grandfather clock in that opera. Uh, so I, I've had a really, I've been really lucky that I had so many great teachers who encouraged me to keep singing and also keep playing and not give up one for the other. Um, cause I think there, there are some people who get pushed in one direction or the other. And thankfully I've had a lot of great teachers who've encouraged me. Um, I actually have a story to tell about one of my teachers who's on this podcast right now. and may not remember that he taught me one lesson. I actually had one lesson with you, Anders, um, at the Zeltzman Marimba festival <laughs> in God knows what year that was. It was a long time ago. And I think it was the one that was in, it was when it was in Appleton, oh, um, yeah. one of the yeah. years. And I had one lesson with you and I was working on uh, a Wazen's Northern light. And there's this, there's, there's this part in the piece or after the chorale where it gets to the fast 16th note thing, you know, and I was struggling to make it really rhythmically steady and, and uh, to have, have vibrancy and things. And I remember you said something to me that has stuck with me to this day. You said, pretend like you're playing with other people. Like pretend like you're part of an ensemble and then everything will just kind of fall into place. And I still use that in my own teaching to this day. And I still use that concept. Anytime I have a solo piece where I just can't seem to make it groove or lock in or whatever, I think, remember what Anders said? He said, just play like you're playing with other people and imagine what the other parts might be. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. I don't, I don't know if you remember that, but it meant a lot to me. <laughs> Thanks for that. Wow. He was actually he was just talking about that in a in a clinic today. Like, what would the orchestra be doing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's such a valuable teaching tool. I mean, it's really stuck with me. It's kind of I'm sorry if I talk a lot here now, but it's like um, um, grew up with choirs. Sweden is a choir country, so I learned to play marimba through the choirs. So I think that's why I always talk about these things because I always when there is a chorale, I'm always you know and I. My first less or less my first rehearsal with the choir was like, Elders, can you help the bassist? It's like, oh, uh, wait a minute. And that's how you you create your technique through the voices, like to help them, instead of reading a marimba book or something, which I never did because I was too lazy about that. But it's like the the really the voice have always follow me as well. So I think you're in, in really in, in a very good path because percussionists especially need to use the voice. Yeah, isn't it so funny as percussionists, we're already asked to do so many things. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of insane. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, voice is just one more element that a uh, difficult thing that we're trying to do as well. So I, I feel lucky that I've had the opportunity to to do that as part of my career, too. Most of my work now is in church music and it's Holy Week this week. So I have a million singing gigs this week. Um, and it was Palm Sunday this morning, so we had a double, and I'm actually pretty vocally fatigued. I'm surprised my voice is actually still working this afternoon. <laughs> uh, thanks, wow. thanks for telling the story. <laughs> oh, yeah, my pleasure. I'm, I'm going to steal that comment when I can't think of what to say in my next lesson. <laughs> <laughs> what with the violin? Because, <laughs> I mean, yeah, when, yeah, come on, that could apply. All this could. <laughs> Carly, yeah. I think you found a Facebook question there, right? Yeah, we have a question from Mario Perez. Um, what sort of repertoire would you recommend to somebody hoping to begin a foray into theatrical percussion? That's a great question. Um, I think one of the, the difficulties of the theatrical realm is that most of the music is really hard. Um, 
musically and and then you've got to speak and sing or do whatever else the composer is asking you to do on top of that um so the jennifer stasic piece that i mentioned before six elegies dancing for marimba and composed movement is one that comes to mind it does not have speaking but it has theatrical elements um certainly the song stuart saunders smith songs one through nine that you mentioned carly i think is a great introduction the setup is also very small it all fits on a tiny little table um and the spoken elements are you know done with some sort of more simplistic percussion playing so it's not as technically involved so i think that's a really good place to get started and i often will um encourage my students to take that one on when they're first getting started with the stuff he also has a piece poem um that was one of his earliest theatrical pieces that can be done with a separate narrator or you could do it um, by yourself and play the part as well um there's always the Zhevsky. Uh, the name is escaping me for the flower pots. What's that piece called? To the to earth. earth. To the earth, yeah. And that one, and where the the speak spoken rhythm, um, I can't remember. Is I've never actually done it. Is it actually set with the rhythm that you play, or is it separate from the rhythm that you play? I remember parts of it are like written out in rhythm, but I think most of it is not. Uh, okay. And it's just kind so of written I, I, above yeah. the music. I think where it starts to get really difficult is if the playing part is hard and then you're also trying to sing. I mean, I think singing and playing, you know, one of the things that I discovered very quickly is as I was doing the, the dissertation project where I was trying to sing and play for the first time is how difficult that is. It gave me a lot of even more appreciation for singer songwriters, which is one of my favorite genres of music. Um, just all these people who play guitar so well and sing. Paul Simon and Chris Stapleton and all these amazing artists out there who do this stuff all the time. Um, I wanted to mention too, since we're talking about singing and playing marimba, there is actually uh, an inaugural year of a new festival um, this summer. Brian called, Calhoun. Uh, yeah, so Brian Calhoun is working with Doug Smith, who's the professor at uh, Utah Valley University. Um, and he's got a festival that he's running from June 20th to 22nd, and I'm going to be out there for that. I'll play the authors. Um, and they're going to have a whole series of training things for people. They're going to have um, voice classes with a voice faculty member, um, so you can actually get some singing-specific training. They're going to have a bunch of student performances and faculty performances. Emmanuel Sejourné is coming out from France as one of the guest artists to talk about um, composing for the genre, and there'll be a bunch of concerts and things, so it should be very cool. One piece that, that Lee mentioned that comes up a lot with this, I think, and it really answers that question well, is the Zhezki to the Earth, which if anyone's not familiar, it's spelled R-Z-E-W-S-K-I. It looks like Rizewski, but it's pronounced Zhezki. But another one is, are you guys familiar with Fall of the Empire? I think only because you mentioned it one, a long time ago. <laughs> it's like it's like five or seven movements. I want to say five movements. Uh, and I think each movement is for a different thing. Like, I think one is for, uh, like, bean pod shaker. One is for vibraphone. There's one for, like, four metal sounds. Um, but it's it's much in the same vein as To the Earth. But To the Earth gets played so much. And I think that one is actually more fun to listen to. Um, so that's another one that people could check out. And it's you could definitely do just one movement. You wouldn't necessarily have to do the whole piece. I think there's one movement for chimes also. But that's not another one. And the nice thing about Jevsky's music is that uh, it is legally all available online for free. So, and like to the earth, you know, it's for four or five, it's with four flower pots. So it's not exactly a big financial investment to get this stuff and try it out. Is it okay to use like bongos if you can't find flower pots? Yeah, that no, I think yeah, that's in the score. That's fine. That's good. Yeah. You know, speaking of this, I think this is a good question because I've had several students say, you know, I want to dive into a piece like this, and I, I or I want to do a really hard either theatrical piece, gestural piece, pantomime piece, like aphasia or silence must be, or like a hard tape piece, and because of this question, I'm, I'm often very hesitant. You know, I feel like, oh, in, in my head, these are very hard, hard pieces. You know, there's like songs one through nine. Those rhythms are wild and there's so much to do. But Laurel and I, with, with uh, two of our students, we just said, yeah, what the heck, let's do it. And man, we've got a senior playing aphasia. It's fantastic. And I thought, man, this is such a gap. Like I, in my head, that is such a hard piece. And part of that's probably because I've never done it. So, I mean, it looks so intimidating. And I started a little slow with him learning it. You know, a few a few weeks went by and it was like kind of inching along. And then just one week he came back and he had the whole thing done, memorized. 
and it's really, really fantastic. I mean, it's just really, I, it just really, really surprised me. I mean, he's a good player and everything, but I didn't think that he would seal that gap so great. And likewise, the student who did songs one through nine, his name is Jacob Reeves. He's a junior here, and Christian Davis is the senior doing aphasia, and we've just been amazed and they both have done it in studio class and everyone's just blown away and it's just really really encouraging you know maybe they can <laughs> i don't know they can surprise us um, a lot but i i wanted to ask i guess kind of everyone how because you know this music students often young musicians and a lot of professionals too like they they often say oh, this is so weird why do you guys play all this weird stuff all the time and i kind of want to know wh what do you think is the value in doing you know, these types of pieces, for example, and, and I think I'll start it with a question that I found on YouTube, or not a question, a, a comment that I found on YouTube. And I don't want to, I don't want to tell you who the, the person is, it's a young kid. And it's in a response to Ligeti's symphonic poem for 100 metronomes. And yeah, please don't find this in like, you know, comment against the kid or anything. It's a perfectly like well-written and fair comment. But the comment says, I really don't understand why people make this kind of stuff. Interesting, sort of, practical or useful? No, not in any redeemable way. This kind of piece is why my parents never wanted to go to my concerts in college. Yes, classical musicians and theory fanatics find this fascinating, but what does it actually teach us? What musical purpose does it serve or provide? It is just a waste of time. <laughs> this is why people don't take us, or at least me, seriously. Yes, we get praise from our peers, but what does that mean if the praise we get is from someone who has a bias toward the study of rhythm in the first place? If I'm missing the point, then someone please let me in on it. So again, like I think it's a well-written and, and totally fair question. How how would you? I know Carly, you do some out there stuff. You do Mauricio Cagle. What do you what do you say to that? <laughs> you know, there's so many questions that come to mind in response to this. Like like the question, what is the value of this? Why do we do this? And um, you know, one thing the person that wrote that comment is saying kind of what's the point if only other people that do what we do appreciate it? Like, does it matter if you move and affect one person or a hundred people or a thousand people? Like to me, the, the goal is still to move and affect anyone, like just, just yeah. to have that kind of, that kind of connection. Um, but you know, I've actually, I've actually kind of had the opposite experience. It sounds like from that commenter on reception of pieces for theatrical percussion, um, because I've had I've had family members that aren't musicians and aren't artistic at all, and you know people sometimes my students' parents and family like non non artsy people, non musical people um, that come and and there's something about theatrical percussion that reaches them, and I think part of it is that we're using so many human elements like our voice or our our movement or actions, um, and that can reach a non musician sometimes in a, a more direct way than just the, the notes we're playing or the, the pitches and rhythms and everything. Mm. Um, I can actually so I can actually vouch for like after one of Carly's recital her family recitals her family came. I think it's when she played Dressur and Carly was like, I thought they wouldn't really get it or they would hate it. And they were like, oh my God, that was amazing. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking what's that everybody experience. gonna think? This guy's gonna rip off his shirt and beat his chest with coconuts and, and you know me. <laughs> <laughs> relatively conservative family members were saying like, wow, this is great. Or, or when I did yeah. Corporal, you know, I was thinking they're going to be scared and concerned about me, but they're like, wow, that was amazing. And, um, so I don't know, I, I suppose it depends on your audience and the people, um, that are, that are listening to you, but I don't think, I don't think maybe there's a limited interest in this type of music, um, partially because it's not really in like the main, the main, you know, core of, of what we consume as, as listeners. But um, I don't think that makes it any less valuable or less important. Well, I forget who said it, and I feel like it was on the show. It may have been one of us or even myself, but we, I feel like we often underestimate the audiences. You know, we feel like they, they need candy when they, they really might not, you know. And, I, and I've had this very similar experiences with family members and with people who are very new to 20th, 21st century music, you know. Anders? Oh, my <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is very connected with what I do a lot. I mean, with improvisation. And yeah. So I've been also working a lot with 
actors in different ways and dancers, whatever. But I think it's also about what uh, you need to take a decision sometimes to extend yourself or take a, take like a, let's say get outside your own box. And I think this is the perfect way to do it. And then you, as soon as you do it, you get uh, you um, have opened a door to another landscape. And then you add that into your if you then if you play like a typical regular piece, but you have another view of it, and you will send out something else. That's how I feel about it. It's the same with improvisation. People say, "Oh, this weird music, oh, free improv." Then you know, people say, they, "You have a picture of it's crazy." But I have been some. I'm totally convinced now. Since probably '94, I have a, this organ percussion duo now with the voice as well, and we improvise like monsters in the cathedral. And it can end up sometimes we be dancing with the audience or whatever. We play uh, improvise over a back piece or totally free. And of course, there is people who kind of look, what is this? But the main part is like, it's so direct. And it's direct because we took a, take a decision that we would like to really see what we can do with this. And as soon as you stand for it, then it really hits you as an audience. And I think sometimes even I've been in moments where I work with a 300 kids, a choir kids on stage where they everybody's improvising. And of course, some people get uh, upset and walk out. And I think that's also good because you have you actually send out some emotion, some emotional things like right. But it's not to provocate that's 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 the bad way. But I think in general, it's it's a very good way to to open your ears for new things. And I think that comment he gives, I, I totally I agree with you, Casey. It's, it's absolutely fair. But I would say come back in five years when you have right. to do this experimentation and you will have another view of it. So. And there's a, there's a nice conversation that follows the, 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 that comment. But yeah I, yeah, I agree. I think everyone grows and everyone grows at different times and different places. And also some people don't grow linearly. You know, they make gaps and they fill in gaps later. And growth is this kind of you know, amalgamous, messy, messy process. I, w I will say I've, I get frustrated when I see, especially like say, a, you know, a master student talking to a freshman and if the freshman just isn't that into John Cage yet, the older student says, you know, what the heck, this is our repertoire and you should really be liking this and this is what you're supposed to like and it's just because you don't get it. It's like, no, you know, just let them, like Anders said, give them, give them some years, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think, I think also, like uh, we can sit here and come up with reasons and justify it. Oh, it's expanding our, you know, at the same rate, it's like, why climb Mount Everest? Why go to the moon? You know, it's pointless. Like we're not, there's nothing on top of Everest that we're trying to get. Uh, and I know it's a very uh, Steve Schick thing. Like, well, why not? Why not have, you know, a three hour long piece you have to do for memory? You know, it's just like, as a performer, that's fun. That's not about the audience or trying to change anyone's mind. Just, why not? I don't know. Yeah. I find that interesting enough. That was kind of when I learned aphasia, that was kind of it was like, I don't know if I'll ever perform this or if anyone's ever going to like it, but never done anything like it. So let's see what happens. Carly? Yeah. Something? So speaking about kind of the value of um, performing pieces for theatrical percussion, Lee, I'm wondering how has your performance of theatrical percussion informed your performance of more classical or concert percussion or contemporary percussion without theatrical elements? Oh yeah, it's weighed heavily on that. And also just my, my voice training. I mean, it really affects the way I play a lot. Um, I don't feel scared to take time, I guess might be one way to put it. Um, I don't feel scared to play something different on different performances, like just now and then. Um, and uh, I think that's something that as classically trained percussionists, because we do spend a lot of time practicing the excerpts, which do have to be the same every time and things like that, if you're prepping for auditions, that we forget that live performances is about in the moment. And it's about, you know, allowing yourself the freedom to um, have some improvisatory aspects, even if you're working within the framework of something that's through composed. It's definitely informed it that way. Um, and that space is very valuable. Uh, can be incredibly powerful. I mean, Cage is, was the master of that by opening up our minds with 433. But um, I think that is a big aspect of it. Um, I think also just going back to the audience reaction and like why it matters. Um, I, I really feel strongly that 
audiences enjoy this stuff because they do feel a connection to it because of the theater, because of the text. Um, and I, I feel like, and, and you're responding to the, the young person's comment that Casey brought up, I think we have a responsibility as performers to educate and to get good at talking about contemporary music and why it matters. I mean, what is the meaning of any art? I mean, and to, to be able to explain that to a person and make them have the feels and make them understand, you know, what, why it matters is our responsibility. And I think I, I definitely will say that one thing I have discovered to be a very useful tool when performing theatrical pieces is to frame it for people and be like, here's what you're about to hear. Here's why it matters here. You know, here's some goals for you to listen for. Here's the story. Here's the plot. Here's, you know, also, um, another wonderful thing about theatrical music is that you can often put the translation or the, the English text in the program, and then people have something to read. And, you know, anytime you go to an opera or voice recital, I mean, they have the, um, the teleprompters, is that the right name? That's not it. The things where they scroll the text for an opera that's in a foreign language, or, um, you know, they, you'll have the text in the program for a vocal recital. I think that's very important, too. Uh, to have people to help people have a more positive or just more engaging experience, even if the the they, it turns out that they didn't like it or they had a negative experience. I mean, it, it, to my mind, I mean, everything doesn't have to be beautiful and it doesn't have to be all positive experiences. Sometimes the experience is supposed to be negative. Like if you're if you're playing a piece about the Vietnam War, it's not going to be pretty. I mean, listening right. to Black Angels last night was disturbing because of the the, the context. So. Art is not necessarily always about candy and games and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you can make almost like a scientific argument of there's certain limitations to uh, um, certain genres of music. You know, you like I, some of the most expressive playing I've ever heard been, has been the snare drum solo. You know, like a really good, well played snare drum solo that's really well composed. You you get this impact that you just you can't get any other way, at least has been my experience. I don't say it's better, it's just different. It can just has the ability to say something else because it is either, and I think in the case of snare drums, because it's stripped of so many other things. You know, it's almost like you're having a conversation with a different life form. Like if orchestra music is this type of life form you're talking to, then snare drum would be this other one. And that means it can say different things or that probably sounds sloppy, but that's how it kind of makes sense to me well um let's give anders and lee a break i do have a sound this week for you guys so lee we play this little game called what's the sound and i try to ask you guys to take your best guess at what you're listening to and then i do my very best to try to explain it pretty obscure it's a, usually these are like you either know it or you don't <laughs> so th this is a this is a process called sonification and sonification simply means taking any type of information or data and turning it into sound so like a geiger meter right that detects radiation and it clicks it's like there's an audio cue that lets you know hey you're getting close to really high radiation and you should get away so it's just a, a audio cue for that and this happens to be that of radio waves from space astrophysicist wanda diaz she is a blind astrophysicist and she has been doing a study on the x hydra star system and because she's lost her sight she has found a way with nasa and the smithsonian center to and the harvard smithsonian center to create a software called x sonify so that first example i played is something from x sonify and it simply interprets any data you put into it and makes sound out of it and because she lost her sight she was unable to continue her research and was unable to continue with her team and until they worked together on this software and now she can so uh, yeah research project by scientist wanda diaz she's investigating the use of sonification for data analysis diaz is blind but believes this can help scientists who can see as well she suggests that it's easier to make sense out of large samples of data points. In the case, she's looking at 65,000 data points, and it can be very hard to visually pick out on a screen some of the significant trends or curves or something beyond my understanding, but it's something that can more easily be heard. 
She's making these sonifications using open source software created by NASA called Xsonify. And the little star system she's studying is called X Hydra. And it's a binary star system and it is 200 parsecs away. And that term parsec sounds familiar because the Millennium Falcon made the Kessel run in how many parsecs, Ben? I can't remember more of a Star Trek guy, but go on. Oh, <laughs> that's right. It's Star Trek. <laughs> So one of the pieces of data she got through Exonify and through her, her Hydra star system was this right here. And if you notice, there's something very particular about the rhythm. So for a long time, it stays in a very common clave rhythm. And apparently one of her collaborators is a bass player and was looking at the visual layout of their data and said, this isn't a steady clave pattern. So I guess they collaborated and had this idea to make this kind of partnering project or sister project called Star Song. So they take these sonifications print out the notes and have have a whole website dedicated to creating these these pieces of music and they get a little jazz trio together and they play some of the tunes so for example here's one they turned into a, a blues tune and it's still that clave rhythm So that's the radio signal from the star, and then they turned it into this, or the star system. <laughs> and there's a whole CD of these. <laughs> Here's their jazz waltz. So that's the star signal. And then here's the trio. So if you're interested in reading about this, there's a lot more you can find at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So, uh, yeah, a big part of her, this kind of three, three parts to what Wanda Diaz is doing. She's creating the star song page, which is a great way to, of course, encourage public interest and merge you know, the science and music, as a lot of a lot of people do like to do. But then also she's, of course, able to continue her research now. And on the scientific front, this research is happening. And also she's building a case for like, hey, we can get more out of sound than we can with sight. So it's helping sighted scientists as well as uh, her, herself and other blind scientists. And then the third component of what she's doing is she's making a case for the, the benefit to people with disabilities to be able to have tools like this to do what they want to do and contribute to science, contribute to research. And of course, that helps them as individuals, but it also helps the scientific community at large. And she has a really nice little TED Talk. You can find it. It's fairly well viewed. And it's great. It's uh, 12 minutes long. It's really, really nice. She explains a bit of the, uh, the, the science behind this, but then also what she's doing for uh, people with disabilities and how this benefited her. Quote from her TED Talk, just as straight from it, you can go watch it. She says, when I lost my sight, I noticed that I didn't have access to the same amount and quality of information as every astronomer does. It was not until we innovated with the sonification process that I regained my hope to be a productive member of the field that I had worked so hard to be a part of. Yet information access is not the only area in astronomy where this is important. The situation is systemic and the scientific fields are not giving up.
The body is something changeable. Anyone can develop a disability at any point. Let's think about, for example, scientists who are already at the top of their careers. What happens to them if they develop a disability? Will they feel excommunicated as I did? Information access empowers us to flourish. It gives us equal opportunities to display our talents and choose what we want to do with our lives based on interests and not based on potential barriers. When we give people the opportunity to succeed without limits, that will lead to personal fulfillment and prospering life. And I think the use of sound in astronomy is helping us to achieve that and contribute to society. Later on, she says, I think science is for everyone. It belongs to the people and it has to be available to everyone because we are all natural explorers. And later she says, if people with disabilities are allowed into the scientific field, an explosion, a huge titanic burst of knowledge will take place, I am sure. So that's your sound for the week. Wanda Diaz and this project called Star Songs and X Sonify from NASA. So let's move back to Lee a little bit. Lee, I, you were going to offer to tell us a little something about how you deal with like the difficult rhythms in Stuart Saunders Smith and how you practice this percussion part and the voice part. Can you tell us a little something? Certainly. I think a lot of it depends on the piece and what you're tasked with doing. Um, there are some uh, sections of Stewart's music in particular where the text is timed with what you're playing. Um, so in those instances, for instance, if a certain word or chord or a single note is supposed to line up with a certain word, I would just do sort of a standard procedure where I would practice the text separate from the music. So I practice the music alone and then practice the text. But then there are some instances in his music where the rhythm of the text determines the rhythm of what you play. So you sort of have to figure out how you're going to speak it first and come up with a way to speak it that same way over and over and over again so that you can then attach the notes to it. So then you could practice, say, the notes that are there in a steady rhythm, just one after the other, and then practice speaking it over and over and over. And as you start to get a sense of what the rhythm might be, the speech rhythm, then you can start trying to play the notes to it. Um, and those maybe are some of the most difficult things to do. Also just singing in general, because um, singing is hard uh, and it requires a lot of uh, energy and, um, you know, just to get your sort of your face up out of the instrument um, or instruments, depending on what you're playing um, and project outwards uh, and keep your playing at a volume that um, allows the voice to be the most important thing. Because usually in a theatrical piece, the voice is the most important thing. If you can't understand the words that are being spoken or sung, then you're kind of missing the whole point of what's happening. So those are some plans of attack that I've used to, to deal with some of that music. I think Carly hit the nail right on the head when she was talking about how difficult some of Stewart's rhythms are, because he deals a lot with um, pretty complex polyrhythms and things. So, you know, I will often... Um, just break those down, figure out what the component polyrhythm was, and then start to piece those together. And, you know, over many, many years of doing that, um, you start to develop sort of this new rhythmic language where you just see six against five and you know exactly what it sounds like, just like, you know, any rudiments, what it sounds like. So I've actually started incorporating that a lot into my teaching. Um, I definitely now include polyrhythm training as sort of like standard rudimental training now for my students where I have them memorize the polyrhythms and I show them how to figure them out and things because it just comes up so often for us in percussion. There's this great piece by Ben Johnston called Knocking Piece, which is played mm -hmm. on the inside of a piano with two percussionists. And Sylvie Smith and I recorded that piece several years ago and the tempo changes every bar and so one person starts in a steady rhythm and then the next person comes in the next measure with a polyrhythm against that. And then the polyrhythm that the new person introduced becomes the tempo of the next bar. And then there's a polyrhythm against that immediately. So you have to be able to change gears like this. Um, so you really have to know them cold. And um, I'm sorry, my computer is about to die. So I'm going to get my plug here ready to go. But those are just some of the, the plans of attack that I have used to deal with some of those things in Stewart's music in particular. So Lee mentioned how like words sort of have a rhythm and you kind of have to learn the rhythm of the word in your head. And so this Dean piece I was talking about, there's this one line, he never uttered a word. And that, that part was really difficult for me because you have to play with a coin on the thunder sheet and it, it sounds like a typewriter. 
And so, like, the, your hand is playing, like, one E, uh, rhythm, and the word, the third word, uttered, it was really difficult for me, uh, and that's in two eighth notes or that, so, uttered. So I'm sitting in there, there in the crash, and it's super embarrassing, but, like, in my, like, total projecting voice, just going, uttered. Uttered. <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> and oh, man, Ben, I've been there for so many hours. <laughs> You should do it in Swedish. You <laughs> <laughs> oh, then yeah. the, the, this Diana Macintosh piece, you have to chug, you know, chug wine at the end. Of course, you just, you know, water and food coloring. But I had to practice chugging it because you want it to look like an impressive amount, like goes goes down, you know. So I had to practice it a lot, and I would go in and out of my office with this wine bottle. And of course, my students, you know, my students just go like, oh, yeah, he's he's playing some bullshit. Yeah, of course, that's like totally normal. But the other kids in the music building, you know, they kind of did like a double take. Like, well, what, what? Why? Like, no, it's not wine. It's like, a, you know, it's like a prop. I also had to get up to pee every 10 minutes. I was to pee. <laughs> well, you guys, right, we you should just go ahead and get warmed up for your lesson. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a lot of that. Guys, we could go on and on and on, but Lee, I know Lee and Ben and Anders and Carly need to get to Game of Thrones, so <laughs> we, should, we should probably watch. Anders, do you watch? I don't remember. No, I don't, but uh, should I do homework? You should. It's the next okay. assignment. Yeah. yeah, I think the last time I saw you, we passed, we passed each other in the Athens airport. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, that so, was fun. That was fun to uh, see. Summer seminar, right? Yeah, yeah, summer seminar. I was I was on my way out. Anders was on his way in. That was really cool. So at, do, you, do, you do Game of Thrones? Factoid, there is there no joke. There is a lost episode where Casey and some of our other guests recorded a Game of Thrones themed episode. We thought it would be good. Yeah, I still have it. I still yeah. I just uh, I wasn't. Uh, Got to get the bootleg of that one. I wasn't happy with how it turned out. I maybe I'll give it another listen. Lee, are you are you going to watch? I will definitely. I don't have an HBO membership, but I have been watching. I'm up to date. So you're up to date. I don't know if Thank I can see you. it tonight. Yeah. Finally, yeah. finally, they the co-host teased me relentlessly for being like having no friends and nobody else watches. <laughs> we're having a fac <laughs> we're having a faculty party, Ben. That's how. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Lee Hinkle, thanks so much. It's great to see you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Casey. Yeah, of course. And Anders, great to see you. Great to see you. Um Nice to meet you again, Lee. See you at PASIC, right? Yeah. Mm. yeah, absolutely. I'll see you at PASIC next year. Excellent. Or we'll this see year. You, see you all at PASIC. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Carly. Thanks. Bye, Carly. Bye. <laughs> Catch see you all later. Everyone.